Very important conversation we're about to have now with Tibor from Fortress. There was a computer game I used to play as a kid called Fortress. Fortress? With the same spelling or? Uh... Uh, I can't remember. Yeah. Danny, can you look up Fortress BBC game? Go to Google Images. It was not spelled the same. It was spelled like an actual fortress. That was the one. See that? Mm -hmm. So you had this little spaceship and it was, um, it was one of the first kind of like 3D games because... I don't know, how old are you, Tibor? I'm uh, 37. You're a bit younger than me. So did you ever have a BBC? No. Nope. Or a Spectrum? All right. So, so this isn't like BBC, like BBC News? I don't know if it's the same company. I've never heard of it. Yeah. Well, that, so that, that was the first computer. So search up the computer itself. You can leave it open. BBC computer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bottom left. So uh, I, used to, used to, I used to play that chess game top right. So... My dad came home one day when I was about five years old. He said, we've got a computer. It was a BBC, and it was one of these. And the first game I ever played was a game called Manic Miner. You search for Manic Miner, Danny. So this is what games look. There you go. Hmm. You can get emulators and still play this, right? I'll do it afterwards, and I'll show you. Right. I'm a legend at this game. <laughs> but it, it was just simple 2D stuff mm -hmm. like this. Chucky Egg was another one, and yada, yada. Uh, I don't know what that Manic Miner is on that Wikipedia. That's like an updated new graphics version. Yeah, it's Chucky They all Egg. look exactly the same. Yeah, well, you know, they, didn't, they weren't that powerful. Um, I used to sit there just playing it, but I used to always scratch my nose like this, and I ended up with a big scab on my nose. My dad will tell you about <laughs> So if you go back to Fortress, spelled differently, like an actual Fortress. Although I believe you've probably got the same intention yeah, to I mean, sound like a Fortress. It is, yeah. That, that was part of the, uh, the idea behind the branding. So... Either you can get the domain name or someone can't spell. <laughs> I'm not going to point any fingers. <laughs> <laughs> what, is, what is Fortress in Spanish? That's a good question. No, get Fortress back, Danny. Bring okay. Fortress back. So this game, Fortress, was one of the first 3D games that you would get. And um, you had this little spaceship, and you just had to keep navigating around like the obstacles that would get in the way. But see the red and white kind of line, bottom right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you'd have to... Um, You'd have to refuel, so you'd have to, like you'd have to find that there's an oil drum there. You can see it. You'd have to get one of those, and then you'd have to go up and down. So like, there's a, suddenly a wall would appear, and you'd have to go, like go up to get through the wall, and things would try and shoot you. And it's a pretty fucking cool game back then. <laughs> look at the look at the front cover. That's so cool. Yeah, that's Fortress. Anyway, welcome to Bedford, Tibor. Thank you. Nice to be here. Got the uh, scarf up for you. Thank you, sponsor of Rail Bedford. Well, thank you for giving us the opportunity. It's uh, it's a really, really cool experiment, and, and we're happy to be able to be part of it. Well, it's um, uh, it's, I mean, it's more than an experiment for me. It's uh, <laughs> this is like a childhood dream. And I don't know how much you know about football, but um, the UK football pyramid is like four professional leagues: Premier League, Championship, League One, League Two, and we've never had a team in Bedford in the football league, and we're quite a big town to not have that, mm. and so childhood dream wanting to do it but i'm only able to do it because of people like you sponsoring it is you've given us the capital to be able to invest in the ground and the team and you know do everything right in terms of merchandise and shirts and our program which i showed you and you know it was um it i guess it was an experiment in some ways but two games in it's, it's going all right well, it's an amazing start to the season congratulations have you watched any of the goals um i have to admit i haven't oh my you've seen them <laughs> You got it. Well, I'll show you after this. Yeah. I'll show you the first goal off striker Kevin Owusu. Two minutes into the first game, he hits a 30 yard. Do you actually like football? Hold on. Not, I wouldn't say I'm a big fan. I, I enjoy watching it, but I'm, I'm not a, a big football Where fan. Where are you from? What city are you from? So I'm based in, in Malaga, Spain. Yeah. I'm originally, I'm Hungarian. Hungarian. Yeah, yeah. I can't think of any Hungarian teams. Mm -hmm. Good his, historical um, international team. Didn't they win a World Cup once? Did they? I think Hungary won the World uh, Cup in once. In the 70s? Yeah. Well, it was a long time ago. Long time ago. Yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure Hungary won the World Cup. Well, anyway, thank you so much. But but not only is it a you know, childhood dream to run this football team, and I've got this dream to get them in the football league, I'm also trying to run it as best like a Bitcoin company. Yep. We were joined by your colleague, colleague Alex Cannon, who I am... I own a reply to an email from a while back because there's <laughs> lots of things we're still trying to do, but we are trying to operate it like a, 
not not entirely on a Bitcoin standard because we can't because we have bills to pay and players to pay, but we're trying to operate like a Bitcoin company. So working with a company like yourself is going to enable us to do things. We should probably to lay it up. Tell people about Fortress and what it is you guys do. So Fortress um, is a platform that allows primarily enterprises to run on on the Bitcoin standard. So effectively run your business on, on the Bitcoin standard. And um, this obviously can mean many different things, right? So if, if we boil it down to um, what our vision is of, of, of a company running on a Bitcoin standard, we mean um, using Bitcoin as an operational currency. So if you look at the typical use cases you see in the corporate world today for Bitcoin, like the MicroStrategy model, the, the buy and hold, you hold it as a treasury asset and, and you, you hope that it appreciates, or you see a lot of um, uh, companies introducing Bitcoin as a payment method, as an alternative to credit cards or other payment methods. Uh, but they do so in a um, hands-off manner where they use a third-party payment processor that settles to them in fiat. They don't actually touch Bitcoin. So when we talk about using Bitcoin as an operational currency, it's it, it can be the base unit of account for your business. You can now pay your staff in uh, in Bitcoin. You can pay your contractors. You can use it for large multinationals. You can use it for cross-border settlements. Uh, obviously, you're holding it on the balance sheet as well. Uh, but you're using it to run your your day-to-day operations for your business. Right. I'm going to run through with you shortly how we're using Bitcoin within the football club, and then you can talk to me about uh, how Fortress would actually mm. help us improve things because we've, we've run into some a few blocks here. But to benefit from Fortress, you don't need to be on a 100% Bitcoin standard, right? It's just you know, certain companies who maybe you partially use Bitcoin can benefit. Correct. Um, the reality is that we live in a fiat world, yeah. right? And um, whichever jurisdiction you're operating in, your accounting is going to be bound for by that jurisdiction and you will have to do your accounting in, in fiat um, and you have to interact with the, the fiat world. Um, so typically what we see uh, among our customers is um, they have their existing fiat infrastructure, financial infrastructure, right? be that service providers, tooling. Um, and then when they start introducing Bitcoin, um, they need to have a solution that works nicely with their existing infrastructure. And, and that's what where, where Fortress helps because we, uh, first of all, from an accounting point of view, we have what we call a fiat reference model. So we track bases down to the UTXO level for every single transaction that moves through the ecosystem. And then from that, different types of reporting can be derived. We can feed the data into the accounting system. So we use zero. It's not something that we work with today, but it's um, it, we can look at it. And mm-hmm. typically the, the way we interact with accounting system is pretty standardized, right? So we do the journal entries and... Um, and if that's configured properly, then it should just work. And are you seeing a growing number of enterprises starting to have this requirement beyond, I know, like you said, a lot of hold it on the treasury and hope, hope it goes up, but are you seeing more starting to accept Bitcoin and need a system to help manage this? Yes. Um, the primary use case that we see driving this operational adoption is actually payroll. Or you could put it in a broader category. You can look at it as payroll and rewards programs, right? Um, um, and also the creator economy. That's that's another area where we see adoption for for Bitcoin for paying out the uh, royalty holders, the artists. Um, and I suspect that's just the beginning. Uh, we, we obviously we have among our customer base some early adopters, but we're seeing a pattern emerging there, and um, we're seeing larger, more traditional multinational corporations starting to do some tests for using Bitcoin as a cross-border settlement tool as well, which is very encouraging. Interesting. Tell me more about that. Well, effectively, if you look at the challenges, of, especially for multinationals that move a significant volume of liquidity across uh, international um, uh, jurisdictions, the banking system can be quite so at times and quite challenging. Uh, and expensive as well. So obviously Bitcoin, when you effectuate a Bitcoin transaction, that's final settlement. It can be very cheap if done properly, uh, but also there's another significant benefit, which is when typically when you're sending money on, on the, in the fiat world, 
the money and the message arrive at different times. And what we mean by that is we're looking at use cases, right, with large corporations where they're doing thousands upon thousands of transactions a day. And ultimately, funds might hit an account, but there's no metadata coming with, with that transaction. And then there's the challenge of reconciliation and matching all of those. Well, with Bitcoin, that's different, right? You get a transaction, final settlement, and the message arriving at the same time. And, and this is where um, Fortress helps those use cases because we integrate with uh, treasury management systems, ERPs, and then we can feed that data in real time. So effectively, you, you take reconciliation from being a, a challenging process to fully automating it for, for Bitcoin transactions. And so for the, using Bitcoin to settle across borders, is that jurisdiction specific where people are finding the use case? Because uh, I know, for example, I trade with the US because of the podcast. Yes. I've got sponsors there. Whenever they want to pay me, it's not too difficult. I give them my Swift or uh, see how they are, my IBAN numbers, and usually settlement's pretty quick. Um, but I have had it where I worked with a guy in Japan and we couldn't find a way to connect our bank accounts. And also when I was in El Salvador, I was with somebody who was trying to send money into El Salvador from the US and it became close to a nightmare. There were limits, IDs. It was just it was so painful. In the end, they, they actually did do a Bitcoin transaction. So is it jurisdiction? It, it on- is definitely jurisdiction specific. Uh, but what's interesting about Bitcoin is once you've set up your system, it's jurisdiction agnostic. Yes. So you have a system that now works worldwide. Um, in certain jurisdictions, maybe a fiat transfer makes more sense. Um, but in most, and from if you're looking at it from a global perspective, a Bitcoin is definitely going to be superior from from for many use cases. And and are those companies just using Bitcoin to send the payment across borders? Are they then just converting it straight back to fiat, or, or what's the? They're holding a, um, a position, right? They're holding Bitcoin on the balance sheet as well, um, but they're separating the two use cases. Mm-hmm. So that's where. We look at that and, and basically classif- you're classifying the use of Bitcoin uh, depending on, on its intended purpose, right? And, and this is important not just from, from a use case perspective, but also from a legal compliance and tax compliance perspective as mm. well. Because the reporting requirements are going to be different for holding it when you're holding it as a treasury asset versus when you're using it as a payment asset. Right, but could you have companies who come to you and say, listen, we've got to settle globally a number of countries, we're having difficulty with the banking system, uh, we want to use Bitcoin to do this, but we don't want to hold Bitcoin. Is that a possibility? It, it is common. It's common, that's what you're saying. It is like, common. Yeah. Uh, what we see is, is almost um, like an educational um, element to this, where typically, that, that's what we call a hands-off approach, right? Typically, that's where... When, when you have a, a company that, that wants to look at um, utilizing Bitcoin, um, they will take this approach first, just because they don't want to be too exposed to the price fluctuations. And, and that is something that we can facilitate. We have partnerships with uh, liquidity partners that can do quick and on and off ramping to, to be able to facilitate this. And you could even call it using Bitcoin as a network and not necessarily holding it as an asset, right? Uh, and, and try to minimize exposure to, to price fluctuation. But what we typically see is that's just a gateway. Once they start using it, once they start learning what the benefits are, they, they will become. That. They want to hold it. Yeah. Always now that, away. that that doesn't mean that, as you said, right? Even even your um, your company, you live in a fiat world. You have bills to pay. That doesn't mean that they hold all the Bitcoin, right? But they can establish. Um, level of comfort that they have for uh, exposure to price fluctuation on the treasury side, and then anything above that they can offer up into fiat, uh, and they can define their operational controls. But you only, you only support Bitcoin, right? At the moment, um, so we built, uh, it, it's a touchy in? subject. Solano, so. <laughs> Ethereum, Dentacoin, what do you bring in? Um, we built this on Bitcoin. Obviously, we believe that Bitcoin is really the, the, the only truly decentralized network that can offer this kind of uh, um, innovation. And that's where the volumes were, and that's where the volumes still are. Uh, but what we're seeing is with these traditional corporates moving into the space, um, they want to test the waters and they want to um, be able to work with primarily stable coins and some ERC-20 tokens so- as well. So 
we have a choice, right? We, yeah, we can exactly. either just ignore that. But um, I, I will draw an analogy uh, going back to, to uh, real Bedford, right? You live in a fiat world. Yes. Right? You couldn't run that on Bitcoin only. No. Nope. Now, um, we have t- two choices here. We either just say, no, we're, we're, we're going to work with Bitcoin only and ignore everything else. And uh, the reality is we will have to say no to potential uh, customers who do want to educate themselves. They want to... Uh, to run a few tests or proof of concepts and and, and see how it works. Um, so w- the approach we've taken is we view these stable coins and, and ERC20 tokens in the same lens as we view fiat from an interoperability point of view. Right. So yes, you have you can run your business on the Bitcoin standard, but you will have to interoperate with fiat and potentially other tokens. Right. Because I was heading towards it because I was thinking of stable coins because. Uh, when I start talking to you about my football club, one of the challenges I have at the moment is I'm essentially operating two disparate uh, financial systems. One yep. is a Bitcoin one and one is a fiat one, which yes. have their own different softwares and challenges. But if if I could use stable coins instead of fiat, I could, well, not instead, but use fiat stable coins rather than fiat systems, you could do it all from one system. And then that balancing sometimes between your Bitcoin and your fiat would be a lot easier. It would help because the um, financial tooling that exists would it's easier to repurpose it if you're just using stable coins. But obviously, I, I don't need to explain the challenges that, yeah, and the risks associated with uh, with that. Um, but I think that's one of the the, the key problems or key challenges in um, enterprise adoption of Bitcoin that that Fortress solves. So if if you look at a take an ERP. Uh, installation, right? The best case scenario, you're looking at six to 12 months project to get an ERP set up uh, um, in an enterprise. Worst case scenario, depending on the level of customization, you're you're looking at something more. So how do you tell people what an ERP is? ERP is an enterprise resource planning system. So effectively, it's enterprise software that covers at at its base layer accounting and and financial tooling, and then uh, it gives you governance, financial reporting, um, et cetera. And then depending on the industry, there are certain modules that you can layer in, like booking systems and and purchasing, et cetera. Would SAP be considered one of those? SAP would be considered one of those. um, Oracle NetSuite would be uh, another one. Mm -hmm. So effectively, it's it's a very involved operation to get that set up. And now if, if that enterprise is now looking at integrating Bitcoin into their operations, they will have a similar challenge to what you described. Now they will, if, if you look at the tooling that exists on, on, on the market today, they will have to run the two in, in a silo. And um, obviously that's less than optimal. And you look at the reporting side, um, is something as basic as getting a consolidated view of, of your financial positions is going to be very difficult. You will have to do that manually. So what Fortress, what, what, the approach we took is we try to design a system that works with existing financial infrastructure. So we integrate with the likes of an SAP or an Oracle NetSuite with uh, treasury management systems to integrate all of your Bitcoin flows into your existing financial infrastructure. So let's say you're using Kariba as a treasury management system and, and you have your cash forecasting set up and all of your global reporting. Well, we can feed the Bitcoin data into that. So. Yes, it works differently than a stable coin. It's um, uh, you have Maybe to track basis. Um, obviously, it, it 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 brings unique advantages. But uh, ultimately, we can still feed that data into your your accounting and financial infrastructure, so you get consolidated reporting, and you don't have to deal with running two systems in parallel. That's a, that sounds a bit more ideal. Okay, so let me talk you through what my usage is because it's been a real real good case study for me to live understand the challenges of operating with both fiat and bitcoin but so obviously we're a football club we um uh, have different revenue streams so one is tickets Mm -hmm. which we sell in advance and we sell on the day Uh, we have merchandise again we sell uh, online but you can also uh, buy them at the ground we sell programs, which you can buy online and at the ground, including subscriptions online. And then on match day, we have uh, the ability to buy merchandise. We have the ability to, uh, sorry, not merchandise, uh, we've already covered that, uh, food and drink, beer, you know, a burger, whatever. And 
in every scenario, we want to be able to accept fiat and Bitcoin. We also have the need to pay people. So we have staff and we mm-hmm. have um, uh, kind of running costs and like um, bills, you know, things like gas, electric. So there's a range of things. Um, what The way we set it up, oh, and we have sponsors, right? So any sponsor that's paid me in Bitcoin, I'm holding in Bitcoin in our treasury. Anyone who buys merchandise or buys for anything in the ground and pays in Bitcoin, it's like one in 15 to one in 20 transactions. Uh, all runs through open node and we keep that 100% in Bitcoin. Because mm-hmm. we're like, because it's because of the volume, we know we never need that for operational costs. And, but we keep them what we call our float. It's like our Bitcoin float. And then what happens is when we have any Bitcoin payments that need to be made, we pay that from that float. Um, we're not paying anyone yet in Bitcoin, but I'm assuming it's going to come. At least one player, I think, is going to turn around and say at some point. In terms of how we manage this, it's all over the place. Mm-hmm. But the thing that's all over the place is the Bitcoin side. It's not the um, it's not the fiat side because, as you are well aware, the tooling already exists, the accounting system already exists. Correct. So when you know we've got a Zettel reader, and the Zettel reader has all our stock on there, and when we when we uh, pay something, the stock gets deducted. We get the uh, payment reference goes into our system. The money goes to our bank, and uh, that's all reported in our accounting system. Perfect. Well, that's great. With Bitcoin, what tends to happen is everything just goes into one big pot. <laughs> yeah. One big pile of I don't know if it's separate UTXOs or like records and spreadsheets, but we we don't know. So if you said to me, Pete, how many tickets you sold? I can say we sold this many tickets. How much how much um, Bitcoin did you get for those tickets? I'll be like, huh? I don't know. Yeah. What's the value of that Bitcoin? I don't know. It's that bit is a mess. And and that is the exact challenge that we saw and we set out to solve. Right. We started Fortress back in 2017. Um, and at the time, um, we were looking at all the tooling that was coming out for Bitcoin as an individual user, right? That allowed you to be self-sovereign, to, to take advantage of all the benefits that Bitcoin brings. But there was nearly zero in uh, tooling for corporate usage, um, unless you went the third-party uh, processor route where someone else is holding your keys and and, and they're managing it for you, right? Um, so the use cases you described, um, effectively what we do is for every single payment, be it retail or, or B2B, um, there's an order set up in a fortress. We track the basis. Uh, there's a reference number. Uh, Fortress uh, pushes the journal entries into your accounting system, so it's all reconciled. And and all of the challenges you were describing, you can track. But there's a another challenge that a lot of people don't realize because if you're looking at um, you're, you're coming from a background of having used Bitcoin personally, right? So obviously security, you understand how important security is. Yep. But security for individual use is very very different than the other considerations you need to have for corporate use. So that's where governance comes in, right? If, if for personal use, I can get a hardware wallet. I can shop around. Uh, there are many options. I can set up my wallet. I can secure my uh, my backup. And I can be confident that my Bitcoin is secure. For corporate use cases, we've seen horror stories where um, among potential customers where we rolled out Fortress, um, where they were trying to replicate that in a corporate world. So they had hardware wallets that the CFO controlled and they were locked away in a safe. And, and that's essentially what I have. Exactly. And, and as long as you're a small operation and you trust yourself, that's fine. But there's another challenge. Even if you trust that person, um, there's a challenge of that person potentially becoming a target for attackers. Right. So just so. It, just compare it to our fiat thing. So in terms of running the podcast, yeah. Emma does all the bookings and the arranging of travel for me, guess whatever. Um, she has a card and she can make bookings. Yep. And she sends me an approval and I approve it. And it all works great, yep. yada, yada. On the Bitcoin side, if we ever have, we actually had a need for some Bitcoin for, we ran a meetup before the first game 
and we were going to give donations. Hmm. So we had to get the Bitcoin, but I was away at the time. So there was no way of anyone getting that done. Well, exactly. So you yeah. have security considerations, you have business continuity and scalability, or you're a single point of failure for all Bitcoin payments at the moment. Right. Mm -hmm. So that those are the kind of challenges that we solve by introducing governance. So what, what we mean by governance is defining operational and security protocols for how you use Bitcoin. So you, you can define different types of accounts. You might have a treasury account that you're comfortable that you have to be, you have to have final sign off before funds can leave treasury. But then you can have operational accounts. You can have a if if you're introducing um uh, Bitcoin into your payroll. You can have a payroll account where you can set up, um, let's say, a dual sign-off workflow, where someone in um, in the operations team who sets up the, the recurring payments can set up the order. They can provide one of the required sign-offs, and you provide a, the, the final sign-off, very similar to how you're using the uh, the, the fiat uh, system today. And and goes beyond that. We can also control allow you to control who has access to what accounts, what visibility they have, what kind of uh, operations they can carry out. I'm assuming you have a, an accountant. Um, you could give your accountant auditor rights where they can go and pull all the reports, see all the transactions without necessarily having the ability to set up payments. Um, and, and this is really the, the, the main difference between personal use and corporate use, right? For personal use, as long as you have a hardware wallet, you're, you can control your own keys, that's perfect. That works. But we don't have that for our fiat account because it wouldn't work. I mean, no. Danny needs to organize things. I do. Emma does. Yep. And we, we all just kind of know where to go to do this. It, it's just very smooth. And like I say, I, do, I mean, at the football club, I have me, Emma, Tom, all accessing payments and doing things. I'm the only one with access to the Bitcoin. So I guess what you're saying is you've created the infrastructure that allows people to use Bitcoin like they use fiat. I mean, I'm not it's, saying exactly the same, but like you've given us, you're given the t same tooling we have elsewhere. It's interesting you you would say that very early on when we started designing the user experience for this, uh, we, we had to choose a persona for who's the typical user. And the persona we chose is someone who's familiar with financial software, yeah, but they're not a Bitcoin expert. Huh. And... I like to think that we've done a decent enough job that it turned out to be quite intuitive. The learning curve is is not too steep when when we roll this out to to customers. And, and interestingly, with the the COVID uh, lockdowns, um, we 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 received some very interesting positive feedback from customers that we've already rolled this out to, where they were saying, "Well, look, now that all of our staff is remote, this is brilliant for us because now we we can." still continue operating without having to overhaul our procedures. We can still have multi sign off uh, where we have people in different parts of the world and they can set up transactions and, and authorize them. Whereas before everyone had to be in, in the same physical location to, to do that. Do you have the facility to manage between hot and cold wallets? Is um, there like a, yes. because that's one of the things that the next challenge is that I have to think about is that as that Bitcoin stack grows, I do want that float that's available Correct. Uh, for making quick payments, but I do also want a cold wallet. Yep. And will we be able to mix between the two? So effectively, what we allow um, Fortress users is the ability to set up multiple accounts, right? Okay. And, and every account in Fortress is a wallet. But how that wallet is set up, that is flexible, right? So that's where the security model comes in. That's where the governance comes in. You can have complete cold storage. That's air gap. You can have hot operational wallets. It's it's not really the typical hot wallet where you have a key stored somewhere and it's and and that comes with its own risks, right? We um, it, it's it's a bit more complex than that because you have distributed signing built into this and business rules validation, etc. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, we can make that distinction. And you can choose how you want to allocate the funds among your um, your accounts. The Fortress, are you guys on a Bitcoin standard? Um, we're in the same situation as as you guys would be, it's right? We're, we're, it's a mixed bag. We're we're living in a fiat world. We do have um, I mean, we we do have staff that are hundred percent paid in Bitcoin. We have staff. Hundred percent. Yes, we do. Bold. What do you think, Danny? Do you want to do it? I mean, I'll, I'll get paid in Bitcoin. 100%. Is, is it possible to have this interact with like a wallet that you have custody of? Or is it all custodian, custodied with you? No, actually. So we do not custody 
funds. Mm -hmm. We don't huh. hold anyone's keys. Um, we built this to a self-custody use case. So you have a vault that gets deployed on-premise or in the cloud, That's um, there are a couple of options. If you want to run this on top of an HSM, you can do that. If you want to do air gap cold storage, you can do that as well. And then Fortress basically is a SaaS type software that runs on top of this. Um, and then it hooks into your key management, right? Or your vault for the actual sign off of, of the transactions. Um, now that was the initial use case we've built it to, as you can imagine, not everyone wants to self custody and not everyone has the capability to, uh, to self custody. So we've uh, since then introduced the option. So we, we have flexibility where Fortress customers can choose if they want to self custody or use a third party qualified custodian. So if I if I was uh, yeah, holding my Bitcoin in a, a ledger, for example, um, that that integrates with Fortress, so you can not today, but I don't see any barriers why we could not. Uh, set up so that integration. where would yeah. the Bitcoin? So you said you don't hold the keys, but do you have specific services you integrate with them? So we offer uh, the the Vault software, which which we we license to our customers. They can deploy it, or we can help them deploy it themselves. And then that effectively is is their their key management solution. Oh, okay. So so you have there is a product you have. There to is to yes. Do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And yeah. and that is that a company you own or? Yeah, so we we build that. That's that's so part of Fortress it. as well. Yes. So but but then you are holding the private keys. It's our customers who holds the the private keys. We we license them the software. So it's okay. the same way that when you buy uh, a ledger, right? Ledger is not holding your your private yeah, keys. Yeah, I see. What you're saying. It's running on your own hardware. You set it up. Yeah. You control it. So yeah. it would be similar to that. So in terms of building this, were you were you your own test customer to begin with? No, uh, we were fortunate enough that um, when we started this, we had a couple of large customers who were already using Bitcoin in an operational capacity um, that we could use as our initial use case and, and, and customers. And they were happy to because... I mean, to be frank, they were in the reality of of locking away uh, ledgers and treasures in a safe, and and their finance team doing most of their reconciliation and accounting in Excel, and 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 dealing with all of the challenges that that you just described at a massive scale. So you just built it collaboratively with them. Yep, pretty much. That's so pretty. We, awesome. we built it to a real world use case from from the beginning. What if uh, those two companies had conflicting wishes for the product? Do you, do you do customization or is it complete? We tried our best to build this to be industry uh, agnostic. And our approach was if, if, if they ever come to us with use cases that we don't truly believe in, then we would put a feature flag in place. We would try to do it in such a, such a way that it doesn't affect the core product. And I'd like to think that we've succeeded in that. Um, and today we, we have customers across many different industries and, and it seems to be working quite well. Um, but I think we were very fortunate that we had the chance to build to real world use cases as opposed to trying to figure out in a vacuum, okay, what exactly would be the challenges of, of Bitcoin in, in, in an enterprise uh, setting? It's interesting because um, the, the trend for our business is only one direction. Right? Mm -hmm. We will only see an increasing market share being taken uh, by Bitcoin uh, in terms of the you know, number of transactions we do. I've got no idea if we get to the point where it's you know, much higher than, I don't know, we're probably like 5% at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, I've got no idea if it gets to like 20, 30, 40%, but the tra trajectory is only one way. Yep. And so I guess for you as a company, that's your, your spot in that trend because, I mean, we're going to get to the point where almost every company has to be able to do this. Well, and, and, and that is our vision and mission to allow more and more companies to want adopt Bitcoin as an operational asset, because that's we, we see that as the next natural step in in the adoption cycle for for Bitcoin, right? Um, and then to give them a tooling to be able to ramp that up. So even within um, those existing customers, right, the, the, who we used as our initial use cases when we started, I um, I think Bitcoin was somewhere around. 20, 30% of their retail payments. Uh -huh. And now it's closer to 70. Wow. So just within those, um, the and and it's really driven by the end users. They want to use it. And and obviously from also from an internal point of view, so the, these customers use it heavily 
uh, to pay their staff. Um, so they, they would fall into the category of what well, I would say they offer a digital experience, right? So they, um, they use Bitcoin in many different ways. They use it to accept payment from their customers. They use it to pay their suppliers, vendors. They use it also for cross-border. They have operations in, in different jurisdictions. And initially, they started with the hands-off approach. They started with introducing Bitcoin as an alternative payment method. And bit by bit, they realized the, the advantages. And, and they got to a point where it's like predominantly a Bitcoin business. Um, one of the challenges, I guess, that traditional accounting software has is that Every country is quite different, different accounting rules, different accounting practices. But when you're building software for people who are using Bitcoin, I'm guessing you still have to do certain customization for certain uh, reporting requirements in countries. But So for, for the... Or, 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 or is Bitcoin building a standard way of working? So it doesn't matter whether you're in El Salvador or Bedford or Malaga, the, the software essentially works exactly the same. So... One thing that seems to be common across most jurisdictions today is the way Bitcoin is classified. So Bitcoin is classified as a non-depreciating intangible asset, right? And and if you look at the two primary jurisdictions, right, you have um, uh, the uh, GAAP accounting standards in the US. And for some reason, the, the name of the standard escapes me, which is the, the global equivalent of that. The approach is very, very similar. So... You need to track basis at the time that the explain asset, to people what you mean by track basis. So effectively, when you receive a Bitcoin, okay. be it through in, in your use case, um, you sold a ticket or you sold something on the day of the match, you receive a Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. um, there's a price point that will be associated, or you have to associate with that Bitcoin at the time that you've acquired it. And from an accounting point of view. If you're sitting on that Bitcoin for two years, and since then the, the price of Bitcoin has gone up, from an accounting point of view, the value is still the original value. Right. Right. And the new value is not locked in until use or dispose, right? So until you use it somehow or you sell it. And when you've done that, then you have a realized gain or loss. And then at that point, depending on the jurisdiction where you're in, you have to file some form of tax report for that transaction, right? And that last mile, that is what is jurisdictionally specific. So what we do there is, is we, we try to partner up with companies that do that last mile for the report. We can give them all the data, we track the basis and we give them all the data, and then they can help craft the tax reporting. Or depending on the customer, some customers have the tax specialist in-house and they can build those reports uh, themselves to be compliant with the local jurisdiction. That, uh, that price volatility is one of the biggest challenges to all of this. It is, it is. Us. It is. And, um, and we've invested quite a bit of effort in, in building tooling to be able to visualize that and, and to be able to give... Um, effectively the decision makers the ability to to decide when how much they want to be exposed to and when they should on and off ramp so we we build the capability to track unrealized gains or losses mm -hmm. um, you can look at obviously it's it's the use case i described is very simple because we're looking at one transaction but even in your use case if if that number goes up let's say it goes up to 10% that's still a large number of transactions and every single time you have a different basis, you have a different um, uh, fiat reference that you need to keep track of. Um, and what we can do is, is by building this data model, you can then look and see, okay, right now with the price of Bitcoin as it is, I have X amount in unrealized gains. Maybe it's a good time to lock some of that in. And, lock and, some of it in. Yeah. Or maybe no, maybe I want to wait a bit more. How much consideration do you have to give to the Lightning Network? Well, it, it would have to be significant, obviously, because um, layer two is going to be critical, especially within the context that we're working in, in uh, operational uh, use. And especially for microtransactions, it's, um, it, it will be critical. So we have a significant, I, I guess, almost the majority of, of our R&D capacity is on the Lightning Network right now. And we're looking to uh, pilot... Uh, lightning payments with one of our larger customers before the end of the year. Yeah, so how would that work with us? So the, all of our transactions in 
uh, at the ground are all on the Lightning Network. Yeah. Uh, whether it's, well, it's the only way we can do it, the only yep. way we can settle instantly. Yep. Uh, how would that work if we were to integrate into the software? Um, I guess you're using OpenNode for that. So we yes. would like to have to look at an integration with OpenNode and, uh, and just leverage that. But that's possible to do that. Yes, absolutely. Ah, interesting. Yeah, I guess I guess as you move into, well, I guess your current clients then are mainly taking transactions on base chain or dealing with base chain transactions. Correct. Correct. But for us, we would have to be able to, yeah, we'd have to be able to. I think that we can convert them with Open Node to base chain Bitcoin. You can settle out base chain Bitcoin effectively. Yes, so you could do that. Whereabouts are most of your customers? Are they in the EU? Um, we have a pretty distributed customer base. Um, uh, we have customers in EU, uh, North America, Latin America. We have a significant uh, presence among Latin America as, as well as Asia. Within the EU, do you worry about the, I mean, it looks like they're going to try and regulate Bitcoin pretty hard. Do you worry about them sort of limiting self-custody? It is a concern uh, I think we'll have to see how um, how things will evolve on on the regulatory front um, it is a concern but uh, ultimately one or two things will happen one they might put the regulation in place with with limitations and then once they realize the impact that might be changed mm -hmm. um, or two will have no choice but to comply and unfortunately the EU is going to fall behind on other jurisdictions because of these restrictions. And I suppose then people using your service can just, well, they'll have to move to a, working with like a regulated custodian. And that, it, it depends on what the final form of, of, of that regulation will be. If, if, if the final form is simply you have to identify self-custody wallets, then maybe there is a possibility of, of still being able to, to do so in a self-custody uh, right. self uh, manner. Um, it's. I think it's too premature to tell what will happen there. The EU's, and I'm going to include the UK in this as well, the UK and the EU's treatment and understanding of Bitcoin is so, God, I'm going to swear, fucking frustrating. Because I don't. Know, I travel to the US a lot and I see people building companies and I see regulators, you know, like thinking about Bitcoin and thinking mm -hmm. how to regulate it, but, you know, you, you tend to see more pro kind of ideas coming out of the US, which feels like we really lack champions in Europe who are kind of going to bat for like people like yourself. Companies are building a fucking awesome business using Bitcoin. I think the challenge is that the, the, the people that are drafting the regulation don't have access to good information on, on, on how Bitcoin works and what it can do. I think you're being kind. <laughs> I think you're being generous. I think these people are a mixture of malicious mm. and uh, ignorant. And the information's out there. If you want to find it, I guess, though, when you go to the US, you've got Coin Center, you've got the Bitcoin Policy Institute, yeah. you've got actual people working towards this. I wonder if it's like... Me and Danny were talking about beforehand. Perhaps some of us need to come together and try and build some, I don't know, nonprofit institution that that can work on policy or work with policymakers. That's a very good idea. I I, I, I would be very happy to contribute to that. If, yeah, uh, we should definitely look into that. The I Bedford mean, Bitcoin Institute, <laughs> <laughs> Bedford Bitcoin Policy Institute, <laughs> the real. Policies. Well, no, but I, 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 you know, what I would do. I would uh, speak to like a coin center or the Bitcoin Policy Institute and say, "Look, we can't do this. We don't understand this. You've got the entire infrastructure already. You know how it works. Why don't we raise the funding to fund someone to be based in Europe to do this? Mm -hmm. uh, but they op they operate under you. They work under you because it would only benefits." Uh, it's, it's not a good thing for uh, America or Latin America Bitcoin adoption if the EU or the UK uh, put in place particularly onerous mm. regulations. We want this free and open around the world. We want everyone to be able Absolutely. to access this. Absolutely. One interesting thing about Bitcoin, though, and, and maybe I'm being too optimistic in this, um, but one interesting thing about Bitcoin is Bitcoin doesn't care about what the regulators do. If they end up drafting regulation that stifles the adoption, it, it will just flourish in other jurisdictions and eventually they realize that mistake. 
obviously the optimal path here is that they don't put those restrictions in place that are going to limit the, the adoption and the evolution of this. But the worst case scenario, other jurisdictions will flourish and then the EU will realize that they're, they're being left behind and, and, and hopefully they'll take the appropriate action at that point. I wonder if we even have to go through a, a country or jurisdiction, like a Western country or jurisdiction regulating Bitcoin too much, it breaking and not working for people to realize that it's actually not a good idea. Everything is good for Bitcoin, like Harry Selleck says. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, you, do you know Harry Selleck? No. He's a mining guy. He's been on our podcast, what, four no. or five times now? Mm. Uh, he's got this saying that everything's good for Bitcoin. Even mm. the bad stuff eventually yep. be, be, ends up being good for Bitcoin. But you, you think you could be right about that. I mean, it's just like what's happened with China and the mining. Mm -hmm. you know, exactly. China, China yeah. bans the mining. The mining just moves to somewhere else in the world. Exactly. Mining doesn't stop, and they've essentially taken out all that capital accumulation out of China. Yep. Mm. But at the same time, I think we should we should give Zell a call, or maybe Peter Van Valkenburg a call, totally. and just say, mm. yeah, "We need an English Zell. We need an English Zell." Yeah. <laughs> um, just going back to the um, software, there is one thing I wanted to ask you about with regards to it. How does UTXO management work? Because if uh, you're considering your like accounting practices and the base price that comes yep. in the other yada. do do you do you automat do you create sets of rules so people can automatically spend certain bitcoin first you know, certain utxos first how do you how do you manage that so from the utxo management point of view typically the rules are designed to optimize fees right so you would be spending utxos that are the optimal choice for the transaction you're spending um, but there have been use cases where customers wanted to spend certain UTXOs. And I'll, I'll describe why someone might want to do that. Um, and let's use MicroStrategy as an example, right? MicroStrategy has been buying Bitcoin in several tranches, mm -hmm. right? Very and big tranches. Very big <laughs> tranches. And they will have a basis associated with each of those tranches, right? Now, if they want to sell they have two choices. Well, well, they're going to be limited, right, by the uh, tax law on how, which, which basis they can use, right? So but the default is first in, first out. But let's say they don't want to use first in, first out because the first time they bought it was at a low price and maybe they actually want to lock in a, um, a loss right now instead of a gain. The only way they can do that is if they sell by specific ID. And right now, the challenge with specific ID is proving that you're really spending uh, coins that were bought at a basis where you're look, locking in a loss. Um, so the, the way uh, they are doing it is they're, they're effectively segregating each of, of the tranches into separate accounts, right? So, okay, we're, we're going to, if, if we want to sell, we're going to sell from, from this account, which works at the scale, they're doing it at a large scale in terms of value, but low scale in terms of frequency of transactions, right? But you look at a retail use case where you're doing thousands of transactions, you're not going to have the luxury of separating <laughs> them in, 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 by, by a basis in, in, a, in uh, individual accounts. So what we can do is, is we track the basis at the UTXO level, and then we can say, okay, you're, you want to sell this particular um, um, UTXO at that that price, well, you can now submit your your tax filing, but you can also audit it on the blockchain that really that UTXO that you just sell uh, you just sold was purchased at this time where the basis was X. We've had nothing but sunshine the whole <laughs> ten days we've doing it. The two guys from Spain come in and bring the it's rain boring, with them. Yeah. <laughs> you mentioned earlier you're from Hungary. Uh, did, yeah, so actually, did you grow I'm up in from, Hungary? No, I ah. grew up in Transylvania. So I'm ethnic Hungarian from Transylvania. Ah, yeah. okay. I didn't know if like you grew up uh, uh, in, yeah. Because uh, Hungary was a uh, communist at one point, right? Uh, Hungary was, and then Romania was under a dictatorship until yeah. pretty recently. It was the last dictatorship in Europe, right? So yeah. I, I, I managed to get, get a few years of that and then the interesting environment afterwards. Did that, is any of that had an influence over you as a Bitcoiner? Not consciously, but I would have to say that, <laughs> that subconsciously, absolutely. Yeah, so t tell me before we finish up, tell me your Bitcoin story and how that uh, led you to creating this company. So it's, it's an interesting one. So um, 
my background is in enterprise software. Um, and at the time, this would have been early uh, 2012. I, I was um, working in, in payment technology in, in Asia. And um, so in retail payments in Asia are very fragmented, right? Uh, a, a lot of the, the jurisdictions have their own card schemes and, and different pr uh, programs. It's, uh, it's not as um, unified as, as Europe or, or North America might be. So I, I first came across Bitcoin back then, and unfortunately, I was dismissive. Um, what year was it? Uh, this was 2012, so it would have been a good Fuck. year too. Fuck it. Yeah, yeah. So. God damn it. <laughs> well, we all have that though. We all have that. Um, I'm, I'm actually surprised that my uh, co-founder um, is still not angry because at the time I sort of convinced him not to, to take up a position in Bitcoin because of my, uh, my dismissive approach. And I was, I was looking at eGold and, and everything else that came before, right? Uh -huh. And then promising the same thing. And I didn't really scratch be, be, uh, below the surface to really understand it. Yeah. I, obviously, I've uh, learned my lesson on that. And then um, a few years later, uh, it just kept coming back. And once I looked at it, I realized how this was different. And I realized the potential um, and ever since then, I mean, we've, I've been hooked. So we started using Bitcoin uh, even at that point uh, for, for retail payments. We had a, a couple of different use cases that we were trying to, to incorporate it into. And then um, I mean, just before 2017 was when um, we realized this lack of tooling for, for the enterprise use cases, right? If, as an individual, you had options. You had options on on what to to use. You you had hardware wallets already uh, available. You had uh, self custody options, etc. But for corporate use case, you had a handful of payment processors, or you could just use an exchange and, and keep your funds on on an exchange. Um, so that's where our idea and, and story started. Oh wow! Well, you might have missed out in two thousand and twelve because you dismissed it. But if we're right about this. In a few years, SAP are going to come knocking you on your doors and say, "Hey, listen, we might uh, we might need to acquire you." Well, it might be an interesting uh, interesting outcome. So we, uh, we we spoke about your challenges, right? And I, I gave some examples of how customers today are are using Bitcoin operationally. But we have one customer in particular. While they're not among the largest ones in in terms of uh, of volume, I think they're. A good indication of, of what running on the Bitcoin standard can, uh, can do for a business. So they're a programmatic marketing um, startup, I would say. And they, um, what they effectively do is they have a set of customers that are geographically distributed that assign a specific budget to them. And then they programmatically buy traffic and then they, they track the uh, efficiency of, of, of how uh, the, the marketing is deployed. And they also do um, influencer management. Um, and effectively that, that all gets feedback, fed back into the analytics. And, um, and what's interesting there is they have a distributed customer base uh, around the world. They have staff that's distributed around the world. And they have outflows for buying the, the traffic as well as the payments to the influencers. And they're using Bitcoin for, for all of this. All of it? All of it, yes. Now, I'm not saying purely, so right, they're, okay. they're, doing, they're, they're doing a mix of fiat, but Bitcoin is relevant in all of these flows. And especially for on, on, on the payroll side, right? They, they're using contractors in jurisdictions. Some of them are even unbanked, right? They're in jurisdictions where they will have no other option. Um, but what's interesting is you, this is an example of a business that would find themselves um, to be very challenged to replicate all of this in the fiat world. Interesting. It's funny. I think. Uh, I mean, eventually, I would. It would make my life a lot easier if everything was just Bitcoin. But that's what we want. That's what we're working mm. towards, right? Um, we are. I, I don't think that's achievable anytime soon. Where no, a world where, where you just have only Bitcoin, there is. There will always be an element of interoperability that that you need to keep in mind. Uh, but um, you know that's our vision as well. Let's let's try to uh, to to further the the adoption. Well, listen. Thank you for coming in and explaining Fortress. Um, 
Thank you again for sponsoring the football team. Uh, I'm going to have to sit down with that. We're joined here by Alex Cannon. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to sit down with him now and actually get this all in installed and set up for us because mm. we need it because we, we do have issues with uh, keeping track of everything. Um, wish you the best. Tell everyone where to find out more about what you're doing. Fortress.com. 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 Do, do you have a Twitter account? Do you want them to follow you? We have a Twitter account, Fortress HQ, if I'm not mistaken, right, Alex? Yeah. What about you? Do they want to follow you? Is your I don't, is your Twitter game weak? I, I my Twitter game is is I non-existent. I don't have a. I, I don't. I'm not really big on social media, so I don't what? really have. Has he got no idea of the crazy shit that goes down every day on Bitcoin Twitter? <laughs> I, I get I get a condensed version from Alex and and my co-founder, but I, I try to stay away. It's yeah. Fucking crazy out there. All right, man. Well, listen. <laughs> thank you for everything. Keep crushing it. I will get thank myself you. set up next time I speak. I'll be telling you how I'm using it. Perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.